Dr. Mason, you've really taken us for an inter very interesting ride. So we've got three macronutrients. And what you've told us so far is that the two that we are most afraid of, which is fats and too much protein, are in fact probably demonized with very little evidence. And the one that has been held up on the pedestal as the food to eat most of, in fact, is the big, big uh, is the problem. In a nutshell, that's exactly what I'm saying. And I probably haven't talked enough about protein. Um, I think protein is really undervalued uh, in our society. And one of the, I guess, to make it an adjunct point to that, we often talk about meat or foods like this as being a protein. And I really think that's the, we shouldn't be thinking about it as a protein because foods like red meat are the most nutrient dense foods we have. And whenever you see protein in a natural food, it's invariably associated with a heck of a lot of other nutrients. And if we're looking at eating healthy diets and living healthily, it's all about getting enough nutrition into our body. And so these kind of foods should be desirable, not only for their protein content, but also for their micronutrients, for the zinc, for the selenium, for the carnosine, for the carnitine, for the taurine, for the complete blend of amino acids, which we don't have within plant foods. Um, so number one, yes, protein is wonderful. And I really think that um, uh, our, the body's needs for protein is severely underestimated with the RDAs. So I'll tell you how they formed the RDAs for protein. So the current dietary guidelines in Australia recommended about 0.8 grams per kilogram per body weight per day for adult males and females. And this data was based on the role of protein as a structural substrate. So in other words, as the building block for tissues, for muscles and things like this. But we know that proteins serve an important role in our body as enzymes. And if we only look at nitrogen balance studies um, in young healthy males, and these were the studies that were done without malabsorption problems, without different needs across their lifespan, and we discount the role of proteins as um, important enzymatic catalysts and the like, then we severely underestimate what is needed for optimal health. I'll give you an example of the consequences of overlooking this. So if you have an average patient go to a GP, let's say she's 50 years old, she's fallen down, and she's got a Collis fracture, fall onto an outstretched hand. She has a DEXA scan, she's shown to be osteoporotic. Standard management then would probably begin with something like a bisphosphonate therapy. And then maybe then we could talk about the fancier things like denizumab and things like that. And we would not have any conversation about whether it's possible to reverse the osteoporosis with diet. Simply, I recall being taught um, back in the 90s, that your bone mineral density peaked at ages 20 to 30. And yep. it's absolutely impossible to ever increase it from there. That's what I was taught. In 2002, there was a study that was done by a couple of uh, very clever researchers and they were looking at uh, nutrition. They were looking at calcium and vitamin D and they were seeing if that had the capacity um, to reverse osteoporosis. And they did six monthly DEXA scans over a period of three years. And then they did something particularly clever. They stratified the study population based on tertiole of protein intake. Mm -hmm. Because we think about bone being made of calcium, but it's not. It's made of a protein structure that provides a scaffolding. And then within that scaffolding, we contain the hydroxyapatite crystals and the phosphate and the calcium and all of these mm -hmm. other things. But it's the protein structure that underlines it. Basically, we can think about bone being like a mineralized tendon. Mm -hmm. So if we, we can reduce the breakdown of bone by giving calcium, because a lot of the reason we break down bone is because we're deficient in calcium. So we'll break down the bone to get at that calcium and release it. But if we need to build more bone, if we just throw calcium at the problem, 
we, we don't, we're not providing the structure for the protein. It's like trying to bake a cake with only one ingredient. You're missing something. Mm. When they stratified this study population, and this population was um, males and females over the age, I think it was 65, so postmenopausal females and elderly males, and they found that those subjects who were having the highest amount of protein in their diet wasn't particularly high. They were just in the top tertial. Over the course of three years, they were able to have proven reversal of osteoporosis in their femoral neck. And if you've ever seen a patient with a, uh, a hip fracture, you know how significant that mm -hmm. is. This was a solely nutritional intervention in the highest risk population with no drugs at all, proven reversal of osteoporosis. And the key to this was the protein. And understanding that, uh, and it really just illustrates my point, protein is undervalued as a nutrient. And I think if we're recommending patients have 0 0.8 grams per kilogram per day, especially the elderly, we're missing a trick. Uh, I really, at least in my patients, I would like to see them having at least double that. And for reassurance, when we have a look at the data mm. on whether you know, we worry about what it does to the, the kidneys, mm. the, the data shows, if anything, there was a recent paper out that was done by the, um, our colleague who you just mentioned before, Dr. David Unwin, um, looking at the reduced carbohydrate diet experience with chronic kidney disease, having higher protein intake, it actually found kidney function improved. So there's really no evidence. And in short-term studies, we've even got bodybuilders who have ridiculous amounts, you know, things uh, in excess of five grams per kilogram per day. And I've even heard up to nine grams per kilogram per day, silly amounts of protein who don't, there's been no documented cases of kidney problems secondary to that. So at the very least, we've got medium-term data going up to about four grams per kilogram per day. So you know, if you're telling somebody to have one or two grams of protein per kilogram per day, there's no realistic concern. And logically speaking, if we're worried, we, we often determine that um, oh, we assess kidney function by looking for proteinuria, so microalbumin to creatinine ratio or something like that, because we know when the kidneys are dysfunctional, they lose protein. And it seems that our knee-jerk reaction has been, well, um, higher protein in the urine must be bad. So if I restrict protein from the diet, I might be able to reduce the amount of protein in the urine and that might be better. But logically speaking, if the patient's losing more protein, wouldn't it make more sense to give them more protein, especially if there's no evidence that it's damaging to the kidneys and there's not. Dr. Mason, I really love the way you approach this protein issue because you've managed to touch on every single thing that many of us worry about colorectal cancer, bad for the kidneys, we really don't need that much, and really love those studies about osteoporosis and, and, and protein, fabulous studies. I need a comment from you. Whenever I talk about foods that are rich in nutrients, it's amazing the number would say fruits and vegetables. It's amazing. Well, I mean, this is very simple. Let's just do a thought experiment. If you were only to eat plant foods and to not supplement it for 10 years, what would happen? Well, I, I guess people do survive. Uh, there's a degree of suffering. Well, you, you would become vitamin B12 deficient. Yep. Um, you'd probably become iron deficient because the reality is it doesn't matter how much spinach you have, the non-heme iron is not, bio not very bioavailable. Essentially, at best, you would survive, but you certainly would not thrive. If you were to have a diet purely of animal foods for 10 years, what would happen to your health? Absolutely nothing. And this is incredibly surprising to people. Um, people don't realize that, and this is, there are people out there, I kid you not, who consume only a red meat diet. They're called carnivores. And there's cases of carnivores in America who have been doing it for over 30 years. And indeed, we've got ancestral populations who consume animal foods for long periods of time, like the Maasai. So, and they, you know, they either eat beef and drink milk and that's it in their diet. And they don't suffer from any nutritional deficiency. And the most common question I get about nutritional deficiencies is what about vitamin C? And this is a really interesting one. So when I went looking into it a couple of years ago, um, the first thing that struck me was on a low carbohydrate diet, the 
the need for vitamin C is less. Vitamin C competes with sugar for absorption. So when you're having less glucose in your diet, um, you're not having that competitive inhibition of your vitamin C absorption. Number two, the recommended daily intake for vitamin C was set relatively higher than was uh, indicated by the evidence because it was thought that it was an antioxidant and that would be good for you. So we'll just encourage people to have more. And number three, despite common belief, meat actually does have vitamin C in it. So, and this is another case of where science is a little bit misleading. If you go back to some old books and you have a look at the tables of nutrients contained within meat, and I've seen examples of this, you'll see it'll have vitamin C, it'll have a zero with a little asterisk. Okay, what's the asterisk mean? And you go down and have a look at the bottom of the page and it says presumed to be zero. So yeah. a lot of those references assumed that there wasn't any vitamin C in meat, so they didn't bother to measure it. The simple fact is it's there and it's well known that it can both cure and prevent scurvy. So the explorers in the Antarctic used to eat penguins to manage their scurvy. Um, soldiers in the Napoleonic era, they used to, if they developed scurvy, they used to be fed raw horse meat from horses that had died in battle and that would cure their scurvy. So this has been long well known for a long period of time and with regards to the sailors the problem was that they weren't uh, you know they were often on a diet after many many months of dried biscuits and things like that they certainly weren't getting any mm. meat in their diets there when on those long voyages um, so sure you can get it from from uh, plant foods but it will be very surprising for people to know that there is actually vitamin c in meat and there are as i said uh, as crazy as it sounds, there are these people who sustain themselves entirely on a meat-based diet um, in perfectly good health with, uh, with no documented deficiency. Thank you for really putting it there.